Welcome back to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This is where we blur the lines between business, nonprofit, and impact. I'm your host, Wendy V, and I'm a social impact strategist here to help you build a successful and sustainable legacy of social change. In this week's episode, we're going to hear from a social entrepreneur who has been on a journey to change the world just like you. If you are interested in social entrepreneurship, this is the place for you. Let's jump right into this week's episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. We are here with another amazing guest. Today I have Elaine Volk, and we are going to talk about all things working in Africa and shea butter. I'm really excited about this episode because it brings together a lot of passions that I have in my career. I've spent time in Africa, not only learning different cultures and different countries, but also understanding different goods and how the markets interact. This is a really exciting episode because we get to talk about how do you bring something to market in another country? And also, how do you respect cultural norms? How do you help people make an impact in their daily lives, but also help empower people financially? So this is a really great episode, and I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. So tell me, who are you and how do you make an impact? Okay, thank you. Uh, First of all, we are honored to be one of your guests. Uh, I listen to other podcasts, and we are grateful that... uh, for the opportunity given. So thank you in advance. Um, my name is Alain Vos, and um, I've been working as a change management consultant uh, with a top three consulting company for um, about 10 years with the company and then after as an independent. And uh, over time, my work became more socially engaged and um, to make a long story short, at a certain point, I got invited by a community in uh, Africa and uh, representative leaders of a tribe in Ghana. And um, that's where it all started. Uh, at that time, I, I, I was doing completely different things than I'm doing now. And I had never heard of Shea Butter before. Uh, and uh, in 10 years, a lot has changed. Gosh, it seems like when you tell me the story the first time uh, that it was longer than 10 years, but it seems relatively quickly for what you've been able to accomplish. So I'm excited to dig in and give people details. So I know you said you had a career change. And a lot of the times on these episodes, people talk about that. They were starting down one road. You were saying you were in change management. You were a consultant, you know, doing really amazing things in that space. What was that what made you pivot? What was that decision moment for you where you went from what you thought you would be doing probably the rest of your life to something completely different and new? It sort of grew over time, actually. Um, when I went to Ghana on the invitation, I had a complete different agenda. I was still working as a consultant and I had developed a leadership development program for managers in Europe. And that came of a frustration about uh, how corporates speak about sustainability. That is uh, often about the outside. We don't use plastics. And my frustration was that it is not about the core business and not about how companies earn their money and how they spend their money and, and how they integrate sustainability in their primary process of the organization. So... I had developed a leadership development program with a certain specific uh, methodology where people deepen the question. So the program was an add-on on a project on their desk. And then by helping them in a nine-month program, asking questions uh, on top of the questions that they ask in their projects to weave more sustainability into their project. And by that creating more sustainability in the primary process. And part of that, um, part of that program in the middle, it's called presencing. And in that part, uh, you take people into a situation that is commonly different from what they are um, uh, familiar with. And often that is a nature quest, but I chose to bring people to a complete different reality that also works. 
Uh, and the whole idea of that moment is to shape people up to see that how they are thinking is a certain way of thinking and that there are other ways of thinking that are also working uh, or at least a, a difference and then use that in the rest of the program for really integrating different approaches and, 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 and innovative thinking into action. Um, and uh, the idea was uh, uh, that part of the program was to bring people to rural Africa where as different as the skin color is, uh, uh, are the perspectives on uh, community and also the perspective on money. Um, so when I came there uh, in Ghana on the invitation, um, it was really interesting because people who invited me um, said why they invited me. Maybe I will come back to that later. But what I found out was my program is serving people in Europe. Uh, but what is the benefit for the people in Africa? So, and I didn't want to have a program where we come and we have the benefit and people have an amazing time there or a shocking time there because everything is so different. And then we go and we leave the people there. So we started looking together, like how can we make the program helpful and also of beneficiary for the people who are hosting us and receiving us. And well, to make a long story short, in the end, instead of giving the program, we basically became the program ourselves. <laughs> so um, maybe the people who invited me, representative leaders of the Dagomba tribe, and those are chiefs, but also people in business and in governments. Uh, and they said two things. One thing that they said was developmental aid is not serving our communities and not in alignment with our values and our needs. And trade is also not serving our communities because it's highly exploitative and, 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 and not returning value uh, from what is taken from our communities in terms of resources and cheap labor. Um, and we don't need people coming here telling us what we need, what we must do and how we need to do it. We need people who can relate with us, who can engage with us, and from there work with us on the things that we know are good for our communities. And because those people are rare, uh, we invited you. And basically it was it. You just said about a hundred things I want to talk about in this episode. And, it, and I think that people could probably see the expression of me smiling because I knew that this would be just a really beautiful conversation for a number of reasons. I think one, the fact that we both have come to the same conclusion in our lives that there need to be more people brokering these opportunities for economic development in Africa because of the imbalance in power between the markets in our countries, United States, Europe. Um, the UK, Australia, people that I've met who come to Africa and have that same realization that we did, that there's so much value, not just in raw goods, but in people and the way that things are done, the style of work or the style of um, attentiveness that's still done in detail, even by a lot of people who live and work in Africa. I, I just was so amazed by the goods that could be produced but yet don't have the ability to escape that country and even go to the next country next door. It was just amazing. And so that was one thing I realized, how sustainable is this? And you got back to your, your conversation about sustainability in the program, Nibil, I think that's another thing that we both talk about in the idea that things need to be sustainable. It doesn't need to be you with a solution coming to save folks, but really giving folks that bridge to be able to have a sustainable solution for themselves and their community. And in your case, that's helping to take that lack of access to other markets and get something out there into the world. So let's start there, <laughs> because I think that story unravels a lot of these other themes as well. And we could kind of keep going down the rabbit hole. But I think that um, the other thing you mentioned was the idea to action, because yeah. one thing that your story really resonated with me, because not only was the idea kind of evolving idea, but as soon as you saw the opportunity to take action and kind of move the idea along, 
you further developed it and further developed it. And it sounds like the last 10 years have been pretty amazing. So let's go back and, and w- enter back into the story of um, when you were asked by the Dagomba tribal leaders to help work with them on something um, and really became as respected by the tribe um, for what you're doing. How did that how did that feel for you? Where did work go back to that space and give us more and tell us more about how that evolved? Well, it brought a big di- dilemma. Um, and the dilemma was I had a program that is not serving the community that is hosting us. And the, and, and I am not going to solve their problems or their, their uh, uh, and, and I don't know what helps, what serves. And so basically what I did the first two years was just go there and speak with people and live with people and see who they are, how they live, what they do. And, and I met a whole lot of people and, and, and people with status and influence, but also women who are very poor. Uh, uh, and, and those women groups touch me the most. Uh, women who don't have anything themselves and still collect money to share with other people. Uh, uh, that was an eye opener for me. Uh, how you don't have anything yourself and still you collect money or food to give to somebody else. Uh, uh, and it also made sense to work with the women because I have a background in, 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 in Dutch politics uh, uh, as a secretary of the National Commission for Gender Equality. And uh, I've been a member of that commission for six, six years. And I found out about shea butter. And shea butter is part of the tradition of the tribe. Women learn from mother to daughter for centuries how to make shea butter. It's called the women's gold because it gives a woman food to cook with. It's very healthy, a very nutritious oil, uh, edible oil. It gives a woman uh, health, uh, not only the butter, but the tree. It's an amazing tree. It can become 300 years old. Uh, and the fruits are, uh, are nutritious. The bark is, is toothpaste. The roots is medicinal. The leaves is food and stuff. So the tree is also part of the tradition. And um, it gives a woman a source of income. And it gives her beauty. Because shea butter is the only natural fat that is basically food for your skin. And it has all the vitamins and minerals that your skin needs. And it's the only fat, natural fat that has all of them in it. So, and I found out it's a multi-billion business. So that brought things together. And, 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 and also, actually, I went to say goodbye because I thought after two years, I thought, you know, it's too complex. It's too difficult. And I need to let go of the program and, and the dilemma. Uh, I cannot solve their problems. Maybe what I can do is create life conditions, help creating life conditions that people can create their own future and solve their own problems. And that's basically what I, what I do and what we do. Um, but when I was there hosted by the community in Northern region, I was not staying in hotels. I was staying with people at home. And I also went to say goodbye to what I now call my brother, Umar. Uh, and then he asked me, would you like to help me? And uh, then I found out that he is already supporting the women, uh, uh, both for two reasons. As a tribal man in the tribe, you have dignity and respect if you do something for the community. And also as a, as a religious Muslim, uh, you receive praise from Allah if you are in service for a fellow human being. So Uma was already working with the women from Vitalia, and I started helping him. Um, and basically, we started with nothing, with the two of us, uh, and just try from 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 the ground up. The women were making shea butter in small quantities uh, for themselves, for own consumption, and for sales at the local markets. So the first thing we thought was, let's see if we can get them a contract for international traders for exports. Uh, and we succeeded. Uh, so that was the first jump from making maybe 
a few ounces for the local market, making 50 kilos for export or 100 kilos for exports. So that was a big jump. Um, what we learned was that the traders don't pay wages from which a woman actually can live. Uh, it's complex and, and, and how it's organized, the payments and the production, it's made very complex. So it took me another two years to understand how it actually works by working for international traders. And, and, and basically to say bluntly, the position of a woman in Africa um, making shea butter is extremely weak. It's literally for you a thousand dollars. So if you don't take what is offered, we will find somebody who will. Uh, um, and um, and it sounds like then people don't have power in negotiating rates or negotiating anything in that in that position. No, and, and the mo the women that we work with, uh, uh, Ghana is a relatively stable and 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 not anymore, but it was one of the best performing economies in Africa as well. But the women that we are with are the poorest of the poor. They uh, they are illiterate. Uh, they don't speak English. They cannot read and write. So they also need and still need our support. And we we are trying to make that uh, to grow, make the women grow in certain roles so that they don't need us anymore. But it takes time uh, uh, and a lot of time. And and we do that on the job while working together and 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 just handing over smaller uh, responsibilities. You know, we started, then we had the contracts and we found out international traders, well, just everybody's earning except the women. And, 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 and that was like, okay, the next step was, let's see if we can improve their position. Uh, women make it from home. Um, if we build them a center, they have a stronger position. And, uh, uh, uh that was quite naive, but, uh, that was the thinking at that time. So we started organizing um, funding to build an old production center and, and that sort of got out of hands. Uh, and we ended up with building the largest center in the country for handcrafted shea butter. Uh, uh, capacity is huge. It can produce 250,000 kilos a year. That's one container per month. And, and I will be honest, our current production is one container per year. And our problem is not on the production side, it is on the buyer side. And, and uh, we found out the huge discrepancy in um, shea trading. Uh, let's, let's stick with what we learned by experience. It's probably not only in shea, but this is what we do and this is what we know about. And also this makes it concrete. Yeah? Uh, so with trying to a position where life conditions for the women are better so that they can build a future uh, with an empty stomach you're always concerned about how do i feed my family today there's no plans for tomorrow so if we can fill their stomachs and uh, 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 then they can create at least start thinking about tomorrow and they have the energy to build about on tomorrow so that that is the whole principle and uh, um we, um, oh, sorry, I sort of lost my track now. So, so well, we were talking about the, um, the lack of empowerment, but then you, you started talking about the way that the actual industry itself works. And I think you were getting to the uh, ways that there are very big inequities in business where people are earning at the top and then the folks who are really producing the raw goods in Africa are not being paid a fair wage to live or even to thrive. And I think that that's an important part to always re-highlight is that a lot of the times when people see these goods and they say fair trade, you want to make sure that the other side of the production of that good is actually producing a living wage and a thriving wage for the people in the community where that's coming from. Because we as consumers are receiving the raw good and benefiting from that raw good in a produced form but at the same time, we don't see the poverty or see the things you described, the women who don't have very many other economic options, who may not be empowered, who are coming together as a community to do these same amazing things. 
we don't see that. We see the shea butter in a cute little jar. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so go back into where you were. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, from nothing uh, to making shea butter for local markets to making shea butter for international traders, we are grateful for the scale up. Uh, but uh, uh, unsustainable inequality in how money is divided uh, over uh, the supply chain, uh, uh, there is shea extracted from Africa. The women work hard, get paid so little. It is below poverty, far below poverty rates. Um, and what is returning is it's not sustainable. Uh, it's like a mosquito who takes out your blood, uh, uh, but then a lot. Uh, uh, we, but we are still grateful for the progress. But that's also where the trick is uh, to have women work, uh, and, uh, but not really empower them. Uh, so everybody gets a little bit so that everybody is still connected or depending. Uh, and um, we uh, see with, you, you mentioned fair trade, this is all what we learned over time eh, by experience and by falling and standing up or trying and then experiencing how it really works. Eh? Because, yeah, I knew the same things that you knew about sustainability and was really positive and naive at engaging with these companies and then finding out that in reality, behind the scenes, it's really different. It's different. So um, the interesting with fair trades and also with organic certifications is the closer you come to the end consumer and in, in, in Europe and the US, uh, the more it is beneficial. So uh, for a retailer, it brings an extra profit margin of 20 to 50%. For the middleman trader, it brings an extra profit margin from um, 10 to 40%. The women maybe earn 2 to 5% more, but 2 to 5% more of basically nothing. So that was one problem that we saw. The other one, we had our center organic certified, uh, but we didn't renew our certification because it wasn't beneficial for the women in the way we want it to be. Um, and was also made complex. And that's the second part. Women who cannot read and write cannot fill in the forms. Uh, 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 uh. So they become depending of a third party who then is doing it for them. So they lose control and are not empowered. Uh, so, so. That was shocking for me to see where the whole conversation is about empowering and about um, uh, sustainability. And in reality, what was happening, at least in my opinion and in our view, was the exact opposite. Uh, uh, more control. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll... But, you know, again, we are grateful for what is there. Eh? and We must be. Uh, uh, yeah, it's hard because it's like biting the hand that feeds you. In some way, you know, you need that those trade agreements and those people to give you the, the ability to reach your consumers. But at the same time, you want to find some way to build the true capacity of the community that's giving to us. So I, I think this is a really great conversation. And I, I'm really curious with um, in this dilemma that you found yourself, you found yourself in multiple dilemmas several times throughout this conversation you've mentioned. But within this particular dilemma, how do you navigate that idea of a group of people who are traditionally have been disempowered partially by, you know, lack of education or either said inability to read or um, literacy? How do you then start building the capacity of people to be able to have a sustainable solution and not become disempowered through these types of negotiations or even filling out a form, as you mentioned? With a lot of patience and uh, with an uh, honest heart, uh, the women don't understand half of the things that I'm doing, but they trust me because they feel a sense and the chiefs as well. They feel and sense my hearts and, and, and now we have proven to be uh, our integrity. Uh, we never make promises that we don't keep and everything that we have said, we have, we have lived up to it. So we, over time, we have become very respectful because people can trust us and, and, and 
we have improved already lives for a lot of people and we bring hope, we bring employment uh, and with respect for the tradition. So also the, jo the way that we have built the center, it's a story by itself. We didn't, we hired a professional company uh, uh, because it needs to be strong and for standards, but the men in Northern region are farmers, but you can only farm six months, five to six months. The other months, most of the men are working in construction. So we asked the owner of the company, don't bring your own people, hire qualified men from the villages, from, uh, from our villages. So the men are proud because they built the center. It's their center that they built for their wives and they earned some money from it. Uh, how we developed the center was together with the woman. So we asked them and we spoke with them about the process of shape butter making and it really changed the developing the building plan of the center because we wanted that it's for the women it needs to a safe place for them and it needs to be a, a good place for them to work uh, so so that is how and we made certain choices that are respectful for the community and the tribal values so one thing is if you don't have a center Women make shea butter at home. And that's how we started with the center. And the women said, we don't want to do that. We want to do it together like our grandmothers did. Uh, 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 and that is one reason to build the center, another reason to build the center. Um, and um, one example, it is hard work, shea butter making. Uh, it takes quite some days to make it. And one part is kneading. It is needed and the women need it with hands for several hours. It's hard work. You can have a machine that does in two hours what a group of 20 women does uh, in, in half a day. Uh, we specifically have chosen not to have a machine. Also a request for the kneading because the kneading is also the moment that all the women are together and they are discussing things that are happening in the family, things that are happening in the village. Uh, and if you put a machine there, then it's gone. Uh, so we chose for community and not for efficiency. Uh, one example. Um, and I think if you have had time in Africa in your life, you really respect that decision because of the ability to um, solve problems in a communal fashion. I think that that's always a really helpful. Oh, my dog has decided to join us on the podcast. <laughs> She's here somewhere over here. Um, but I think that that's really important where you offer solutions that do bring together people in a communal way. And um, you said you built the, the center with different decisions based on their feedback, which is true empowerment. And that is um, really helping to build sustainability because people now in the village see themselves in that, that physical structure that's there. Yeah. So I think that that's really great. And um when you were speaking about the the ability for these women to kind of um, now, you know, go through the process with ease and together, I think that you said as, as their grandmothers did. That to me just really is a um, such a warm feeling of being able to bring that sense of um, sisterhood back to a community. And I don't know if you want to dig more into that um, idea, but this idea of community because I think that some people like me, you know, I've spent, like I said, a fair amount of time in, in Uganda and, and traveled throughout South Africa and lived in Tanzania. So I know what that means to be part of an African community. But can you describe to our listeners who may not have felt that or may not know what that means or why that's such an important part of empowerment, the word community? Yeah. I learned a lot from uh, uh, from the, from my community as, as they learn from me. And one of the things that I learn is how we in the West are so conditioned for individuality. Uh, you must take care of yourself first and then you can take care of other people. And uh, it's just one perspective. The other perspective is equally true. Uh, Maybe you notice in the beginning of the conversation, I start with speaking that we are grateful. In the beginning, I was continuously corrected because I was speaking about I, and then somebody said, I am we, uh, 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 you know, those kind of things. And, and, and 
it has positives and 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 also um well you know maybe one example which is really nice eh? and that, that 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 brings also concrete how a westerner thinks different than than an african uh, or at least people in our communities um uh, i was involved in gender e equality in in the netherlands eh? and 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 the Netherlands is considered or considers itself to be rather progressive. And, and we have these ideas that men and women are equal, uh, uh, different but equal. Um, in uh, our communities, that's completely different. Uh, uh, it's a Muslim community. Uh, it's a traditional community. And men and women are not equal. And I can come there with my standards and my norms and say that it's ridiculous. And, 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 uh, 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 well, for instance, one, one, one thing that I did push through was we built the center, uh, we, we raised a few hundred thousand euros and built the center and the community wanted the men to run it. And that, that is where I said, no, that is, that is, that, that, that people have given us money, have trusted us with money, money for deeply a women's association. I cannot explain to the people who have given us the money if a man will run the center. So it must be a woman. Uh, uh, and, and then the community was like, they understand. Right? Then they, they understand the people who have given us money and who have trusted us will not understand that, that for particularly a women's association, a man will run the center. So, but where I deal with the differences between social status or, uh, of, of men and women or differences between men and women, instead of opposing my standards, uh, I use their standards. Uh, uh, and one of them is community is far more important than the individual. So instead of discussing about that men and women are equal, I say, well, it's all about community. It's all about us and men and women have a different, and the first com the first us group, we group, is a family. And a man and a woman have different roles there. And then I can avoid the whole fight or discussion about equality uh, or inequality uh, by focusing on the group and focusing on the collective all the time. Um, uh, and, and, you know, at the same time, it's disappearing. Uh, that's also, we try to preserve the richness and the positives of the ancient knowledge. Uh, uh, local farmers, uh, 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 at least the elder ones, they still know about traditional seeds and about organic farming. Uh, but chemicals are important, uh, and they are important with subsidies, so they are cheaper and, and, and safer than to not use them. Uh, uh, and especially for farmers who don't have anything um, uh, because the risk of losing your crops is too high. Uh, and locally made organic products are, are more expensive than the imported chemical uh, stuff. Uh, but look, our farmers, they can see on the land if it's healthy or not. They can see on the land what you can plant and not. And, you know, it's also that that we want to preserve. And 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 they didn't have technology and they didn't have the chemicals and, and they were doing fine. Uh, what is happening with the chemicals as well? And that's interesting because I asked that in, in, in conversations with, with, with the farmers, uh, women are also, uh, the women are farmers basically and they make shea butter as well. Uh, they were not helping each other anymore on their lands. Uh, uh, and, and, and I asked, how is that? Because uh, if I want to have a plow, I need to rent it from my neighbor. Uh, 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 and they said, it's because of the chemicals. There's no need to help each other anymore. So you see that the chemicals is, are not only killing the lands and basically killing the people, uh, because we are dumping there with subsidies, chemicals that are prohibited, at least in Europe, for use here. Uh, uh, and we all know that fertilizers take more uh, nutritious value of the land than bringing it. Uh, 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 and and, and there, there are plenty of local in, uh, uh, alternatives. Um, but let's and go I, back I to I started also with the seeds as well. 
that it's not just the the chemicals, but also the seeds being used, being imported, the GMO seeds being used in Africa, which were not the traditional. Of course, thing. because <laughs> because chemicals kills everything except the seeds that you have both. But you know, we started organic farming. Umar and I started organic farming. The two of us, about ninety percent of the of our harvest out to people where eh? we give out to people for food don't have food for food so so that that is also how we work in the tradition it's all about it's all about sharing it's about sharing and but if you don't have anything to share it's difficult and still eh, the women were doing that uh, and strength is in togetherness if you have an app if you have uh, uh, an onion and I have a tomato and our neighbor has water with the three of us we can make soup and we all three have a meal. Uh, so, 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 um, what we did with the farming was when we started, we, we gave one of our boys a motorbike uh, and, and some money. And we said, go into the forest and find a farmer who is so remote and so poor that he doesn't have money for the chemical seeds. And that is how we got our first seeds. <laughs> oh my, that's genius. <laughs> that is so genius. You've got to like outrun the chemical. <laughs> yeah, but but you know it's practical, and that's basically what is so beautiful about this project. Uh, in change management, as a consultant, you, uh, I tell other people what they need to do, or advise them, or help them, and most of it is about theories and models. And and here, our theory grew out of experience over time, uh, 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 and from one thing to the other. So we started with nothing, and we had. Contracts for shea butter. We didn't have a center. We had a center. And and every time things were different than what we expected. And it was, okay, what cow? And what is the next? <laughs> and, 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 and then we found out, oh, everybody is earning except the women. Uh, let's kick out the middlemen traders. So I found a, a sponsor to produce and export our first container of shea butter. But we made the shea butter first in Ghana. Uh, and then we exported it to Europe, and then we were looking for, for, for clients to buy it. We are offering to cosmetic uh, producers and cosmetic brands. Many, much shea is, is disappearing in food, in plant-based food, but we focus in cosmetics for several reasons. Uh, but we had a container of shea butter, but no clients yet, and then COVID broke out. So the worst time to start. Uh, but we were fortunate that we managed to find some business to business clients with whom we now have good relationships, deep relationships. They specifically came to us because of my story and our story about um, creating a sustainable local economy as a basis for a sustainable international supply chain. And um, they stayed. And, and that is how we built a small, stable basis in the in the business to business market but it's not by far not large enough what we met most was companies who talk about sustainability uh, and then sitting on the table with them to talk about uh, uh, a contract and it is all about lowest price lowest price lowest price and, and there was one company i won't mention the name uh, but they wanted to buy six containers from us. And I said, you know, this is the price that we pay the women, the, the, the women's cooperative, uh, and that price is non-negotiable because that we need to pay that to them to make, uh, to, to, to make up to the promise that we made. And that price is non-negotiable. We never heard from them after. Uh, and maybe that, that is a step up to how, how are we organized? Uh, is that something that, that, that I can share about? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great because you, you did um, mention a couple of times the, the organization itself and the role that you and your partner are playing, but also you kind of mentioned that you were giving some responsibilities away and trying to empower folks as you go along. So yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now my mind wants to go to, to that place. Yeah, we, 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 we create... Um, experience we people grow into their roles by the experience so so the women know how to make shea butter uh, uh, 
uh, interestingly, they need to learn again to do that as a collective and to be responsible as a collective. Uh, and 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 um, the women um, are organized. We help them organize and register them as a cooperative. Uh, so the women in the production, they have the traditional organization. It's really interesting that the Dagomba tribe is really a closed community and one of the best functioning tribal communities that is there because it's so close and they are organizing groups of 20, 20, 20. And that is what we copied in the center. So women are working in groups of 20 as they are living together in groups in their village where they come together every week in a group of 20. Uh, so we copied that. Um, but we also, because we are entering outside Gave into international trading, we need to add on. And often tradition is replaced for modernity, but we built upon it. And, and, and so we also needed a legal entity for registration of the center and registration of the land where the center is. Uh, we got it from the chiefs, the land, they donated it to us, but we needed to register it as ownership in, 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 in cadastre with governments. Uh, so we organized the women as a women's cooperative, which is a separate legal entity in Ghana. Uh, we are exporting the shea butter at, that here it needs to be processed for, for, for use in professional cosmetics. We do that as a foundation based in the Netherlands. Uh, and what we then do is money earned by the foundation in the Netherlands is returned to a community investment fund in Ghana, which is run by the community. And that makes a triangle. All is called Dipalia. And what we have learned now over time and what, how we are organized now is the triangle is really solid. Uh, as foundation contractor for the women's cooperative, we, we can pay the women a fee that leaves them a net income that is five times higher than what they earn from any other contract from any other trader in Africa. Uh, we can do that in a way that it doesn't creates trouble in the community with some tricks. Maybe that goes too far to explain it because if you find out that your neighbor earns five times more than you do, all hell breaks loose. And our first priority is with the community. Uh -huh. And we are doing this, create healthy soil, healthy community, healthy people in Africa as a basis for our international trading. So it needs to be solid and stable. And that starts with paying decent, 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 decent income. The only reason why people are poor is because they don't, uh, they are not paid enough to sustain in their cost of living. That's simple. So let's change it. That's simple. That is what we do. Simple, made complex by all the stuff and, 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 and interest and, 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 and the yes buts and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's plain simple. We pay the women five times more than any other, which is still close to poverty rate and still not as much as we want, but five times more netto is already huge. Then secondly, by take, and we can do that by taking out all the middlemen traders. Uh, 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 that's one way how we, how we can do it. Um, then we send it as a not-for-profit foundation. So as a not-for-profit foundation, we do for-profit trading. And the not-for-profit foundation has the legal obligation to bring back the money to Ghana. Uh, and, and, and that makes sense. Uh, it's difficult in business and it's difficult. Uh, the, the banks and, and, and professional impact investors, they don't understand that uh, and, or they don't want it. Uh, and then thirdly, we have the Deepen uh, Community Investment Fund run by the community. And it has an agenda. And, and that is also the agreement between the foundation and the community investment fund. There's only one condition. You are free to do what you want, but it needs to be invested in organic farming. Uh, so it needs to be organic farming at the benefit of the community. And um, basically, over the years, speaking with all the farmers, speaking with the women, working with them, living together with them, we made an agenda. And, and also there, you know, it is, we want to make our own 
pesticides. There are seeds on the floor. You can literally pick them. The only thing you need to do is you need to squeeze them out and you have the best organic pesticides you can ever imagine exported to Europe and the US as organic and organic certified. So we have them there. The only thing we need is a machine and a building. Well, we want to make our own organic fertilizers. Uh, shea waste is a, is a extremely good ingredient to make your own organic fertilizers uh, with some compost and some cow shit. Uh, and there are cattle herders there who give us uh, or we collect the shit from the cows and we can make our own, our own or, or organic fertilizers as well. And this is what we have been doing for the past seven years on a smaller scale. And the next thing is protect the land, organize the farmers as a cooperative and make sure that by uh, banning the chemicals, we create healthy soil by, by nature. Uh, and by not using the chemicals, the farmers don't get sick. Uh, by not eating the chemicals, the farmers get and their families get strength. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, then in terms of money, you see that money starts circulating and it's still profitable. You scale up to, uh, to, to, to a certain scale. We have the potential to make 250,000 kilos of shea butter per year. Uh, but you know, with one container, it is already working. Uh, so can you imagine what we can do if we sell five or 10 per year? Then it starts creating a whole lot of money that the community has autonomy over and can spend in organic farming in a way also that is respectful for the community values and for the community tradition and not from an outsider who says we need to do it like this and, and you... Uh, you need to give out your crops for a certain price, which is lower because we have invested in it. It, it is there. And, 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 and still, you can make money here in Europe or in, in the US. It's still profitable, but it is more balanced. And we call that return on extraction. So we extract shea butter from Africa. We extract labor from Africa. We add value over. Do we really add value? No. The only thing that we do is we bring it from Africa to Europe. You, bro you broker the value. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. we do. We, we process it for professional use, in, but you can also discuss if that's value adding. At least it is for our buyers. Uh, uh, uh. And then money is returned. So, so what you see is what I see in the global economy. Money is flowing in one direction, and it's concentrating with a s s ever getting smaller group of people, uh, and that's not healthy. It's not healthy. Maybe for, no, it's not healthy. Like, like the oceans, money needs to circulate. And money, and, and what, what we are doing, and that's the basic element of return on, on extraction, is to create a circulation flow of money that create, that money becomes a force for, uh, for goods. Uh, the, the circulation of money creates healthy wages for people everywhere, not only in Europe, but also in Africa. It creates healthy soil. It creates healthy, we, we want to plant new trees. So it, it is literally money as a catalyzer to vitalize people, to vitalize land and to vitalize communities. And that is there and we, that is what we do. And now we need to scale up. And, 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 and that is challenging uh, because it's so different from uh, how money is being earned. And the people who have the money find it difficult to take that step to share the earning uh, because yeah that's also true uh, if you want money to circulate it also means that it doesn't concentrate at one place with so there's going to be movement from that concentration to other places and i yeah. think that's what people find threatening about that yeah. idea yeah but but and what you see yeah uh, it is always in, in my fantasy uh 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 we have spent billions on developmental aids. And I asked the regional director of Kambu district, which is the highest government official. I asked him, and have we solved the problems? And then the response is a smile at no. <laughs> no. Yeah, you, I love the, the, the sing song you had. That's always the, t the tell for me when someone in Africa is not going to tell me the truth. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you're like, well. <laughs> well. 
you know, we, we are we are very very respected within the tribe, and and that is also means that we are a force of influence, with which government uh, takes into account. Yeah, we also have very good relationships with local government because we have impacts and we uh, 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 and, and and we don't take uh, the credits for it. We share the credits also with the government. Uh, but but you know, the, the the what I wanted to say was. There's always you have trade that is then exploitative, and then we have trade that is then compensating. And that to say bluntly for now, we show and prove that that contradiction is not needed to be there. You can do trade and you can be profitable. You can do trade as a force for good that makes aid abundant. And the simple way is create a more equal divide, a more fair divide. And that doesn't mean that everybody needs to have the same, but make sure that everybody has enough list to provide in their basic needs. And it's, if, if, you know, if we speak of this, it's so simple. And yet it sounds so simple. It sounds so simple. But I think for people who will listen to this, one, it'll be revolutionary, which you just said. That I, and I think you and I have the same vision of unlocking business and nonprofit as a vehicle for finance and resources to come to people who traditionally haven't been able to thrive under the current system, the current way that we do aid and, and any kind of uh, safety net, all those different types of services that we provide as um, usually, especially Western nations giving money out to different causes. And I think that with what you said about business and how we can harness the natural power, a uh, buying power of consumers to bring this aid to people on a continual basis. So it's no longer an ask and give situation, but it is a more sustainable option for people to have a living wage, to be able to contribute to their economies locally, and to then also, like you said, have health which is another key piece of this because you can't keep these economies going if you don't have healthy people fueling them. So I think that um, when you mentioned all of these things, I said, this is just such a great episode for this particular podcast. This is exactly what we talk about. And I want to ask you just um, because I think this idea is pretty visionary. How did you get to this conclusion? Like as a person, as an organization, as a community, how did you guys all come together that this is the way it needs to be structured for everybody involved to feel, to buy in or to feel like they want to be part of this? It's emergent. It is action learning. We try something, it doesn't work. And, and uh, it is togetherness. Uh, uh, a lot of learning with each other and from each other and and i have that uh, the, the, the advantage that i have uh, a mind that is capable to see complexity and and uh, i can make complex things simple uh, uh, and and basically i am not speaking as a lamb uh, I'm voicing out on behalf of our community. Everything that I share here is based on our experience and everything that we do is not coming from my mind, making it up, but it is my mind that helps it to make it concrete into, okay, and then that means that, uh, let's try it. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it makes so much sense. Uh, uh, we are sending foreigners who are solving problems of other people and telling them what to do. Uh, I'm not born there. Uh, I can still, after seven years farming, I can see which land is healthy or not, but I cannot see which crop to grow there and that can't grow there. Yeah? And, and, and who knows best what is good for the community? The, the community themselves. And who knows best in the community? The women. Uh, so. So, 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 you know, step by step, we found out, we try, okay, it is an improvement, but it is not really 
not really an improvement. Uh, 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 and from there, from one thing came came, came the next, and and and. Starting at grassroots level in Ghana with nothing, now our next and final step is entering into the consumer market. So um, th there is a lot of greenwashing. I wanted to say something else, but there is a lot of greenwashing in uh, or SDG washing. Uh, 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 every cosmetics company is sustainable. Every uh, uh, organization that is working in trade with Africa is solving problems uh, or being sustainable. And um, if you scratch, then behind it is um, that's a completely different reality. It's like a window. And the window shop is beautiful. You see the window shop. It's beautiful. And then if you come into the window, it's still nice, but not as be beautiful as the window shop. And then if you go in, in the back in the warehouse, it's one mess. And we are we entered in the warehouse, uh -huh. and that is where we are, and it's one big mess. So from the warehouse into the shop, and now we go into into the shop window with our own consumer brand products. Because you can listen to me, believe me or not, but please come and see with your own eyes and judge for yourself. Don't believe me because I'm saying this. Everybody else is saying, and and they are lying. So uh, why should I not be lying? Uh, Come and see for yourself. And that is what we are enabling now with our next step into the consumer market. The product that is made by the women in Africa can be bought by a consumer anywhere in the world. And we will have a QR code on the, on the consumer product where you can even see which woman has made your specific jar of shape. After. And we want to make a, a, a movie of them. So if you buy a jar that is made by Safura, you see Safura in a short movie telling you how great who she is uh, or who she is and that she has made your shape up. If I buy it from Sanatu, I see a movie from Sanatu. Oh my gosh, oh. as a consumer, I love that. And I also love this idea of adding it to your marketing because essentially one of the components I see happening a lot in um, the impact space is the lack of marketing that needs to be done for people to be aware of some of these, you know, solutions they could be supporting that do also support, you know, the benefit of these communities that are producing it, like you said. Um, and so I think that that's a really cool idea. Yeah, I but, love but, that. You know, a lot of marketing is used to cover up what is what needs to be hidden for the consumer. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> such a pain because you can use that money. And save a lot of marketing budget simply by, uh, 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 if you pay them more, that's still less than what is spent on marketing budget is, uh, that is used for covering up. And then you can tell a real story. And that is basically what we do. Uh, we don't want you to believe us because I'm telling you, we want you to believe us because you can see it with your own eyes. So we want to expand the QR code over time. With it. And you can already see it actually, but we want to expand it with information that you can see what is the impact of your purchase of this chart? And you can already see it because our annual finance reports are public. So if you put the finance report of the foundation next to the finance report of the community investment fund, you can exactly see how much money is going, going around. And, uh, and if you, now you need to come and visit or you need to follow me on, on LinkedIn and follow us on LinkedIn to see what we have done with it. But you can see it with your own eyes. And, and, and that is, we want it to be simple, authentic, and uh, 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 transparent. And, 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 and that is basically a big problem uh, that this Africa is far, and for many people also emotionally far. And, and, and that is understandable. And also, the realities are so different, so it, there is a lot of difference, uh, and 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 there is a lot of beauty in that. You know, we we especially in the West, but also in Africa, people think that the Westerner the Westerner knows better. Eh? He or often she is richer. Uh, they have eh, the West has the wealth, and the South have not. We have the knowledge, we have the technology, and that. So a lot of people think the Western knows best, but the beauty is in the diversity. If you 
see things completely different than I do, together we can see more, but only if we are together. And, and, and that is, I think oh, at, at global scale, a, a huge problem that people are more and more distantiated from each other and also more and more distantiated from nature. Uh, and shea butter is a hundred percent natural organic products. We don't need a certificate. Uh, we need a laboratory test. And yeah, then we can see 0.04% impurities. Well, what else do you need? Uh, 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 uh. So, so, you know, this is about, 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 about being good for each other as human beings and being good for our uh, uh, nature, which basically gives us life. Uh, and it is not charity or not, uh, uh, it's not even a choice. Uh, I think it is, it is really necessary. And, and, and I think we in, in the global North, in the US and Europe can learn a lot from uh, the global South and, and from our communities and, and their values. Uh, and um, so this is not something that, that I am doing for Africa or for, uh, for, for um, uh, we are doing this because we believe that uh, a genuine sustainable future is possible and necessary and challenging if we are not connected. Uh, and that's basically the, the main problem that, that, that people are not connected with each other, they're not connected with nature and maybe not even connected with themselves. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier also not connected as a community as much as you, they used to be. And I think that there, there's so many things in this episode, I, I swear I could talk to you for years um, about all of these things from sustainability to what you just mentioned, transparency and um, how people, you know, really interact with communities abroad when we're coming from these Western countries. And especially because I think a lot of folks with Western ideals as you mentioned, you know, you go to Africa and they say, hey, you came with the solution. You don't want to disappoint, but you also know that you may not be the solution, right? And I think that there are a lot of people who have claimed to be the solution, who have gone, in fact, and, and tried to pass them off as solutions. And then, it, you know, you find that these are not sustainable things. They become these projects that just kind of go away into the ether and they don't actually provide community change. And so one of the things we talk about in this podcast a lot is how do you get to that systemic change? to make these things more consistent, to provide examples for people to learn from. And your example that you gave us today is so powerful and gives so many good facets of all of these issues. Um, but one that I really wanted to end with is this idea of, um, like we mentioned, kind of the, the savior of co coming into a community and giving it the solution versus empowering people to co-develop and to own um, solutions. And so I wanted to leave with this something that I, when I was in Africa traveling, that people told me was um, eventually your job here is to work yourself out of a job and to really leave this place better than you found it. So with that sense, you know, where do you see yourself going with this in the future in terms of not just you, but the community taking ownership and the value that's there for them to, um, to live from in the future? In, in in Ghana, people don't don't know what a cathedral is, but basically, what we are doing is building a cathedral. Uh, 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 and and I'm not Gaudi. Uh, uh, Umar and I together are Gaudi. Uh, so also there, you see, it starts not with one person. It starts with two people connecting from complete different backgrounds and really connecting. And we we have strong conversations and some strong disagreements, but the outcome is always better of what either one of us made as a presumption. And that can only happen if there is connection and there is some trust to be in disagreement. Uh, I think it will take a long time for uh, the women and the community to be fully self-sufficient. I hope that we can make a big jump now 
uh, we need funding for our projects and it's challenging, uh, uh, though it's the best spent money, uh, uh, if you see the impact that we have, but it's challenging. Um, I see how slow that goes, uh, that is delaying. Uh, another thing is, um, life expectancy is much lower there than, than, than with us. So, uh, or, or we have trained a young woman and then she gets married uh, and then she's gone and you can start all over again or, or people simply die. Uh, uh, so. What I dream of, what we dream of is we start in Sakuba village, uh, that is where the center is, and like uh, a healthy virus spread out organic farming over the region, village by village, plot by plot, farmer by farmer, and then the chemicals, one plot by one plot with our own organic fertilizers. It creates a local economy. So what you see is young people who now go to Europe and Europe doesn't want them. So push them back, uh, have, a, have a future there in sync with nature. They can earn money by planting trees or by harvesting, uh, and uh, those kind of things. So what I, what we dream of is this chain reaction where from village to village, money creates health and well-being. Uh, and, and, and we are, we are doing this with Shay. We are doing this with six people, six people, five in Europe, one in, uh, in Ghana, uh, if I say the core team of Deepalia foundation, and then in Ghana, it's also a small, small, small group of people, five people there together. So we are doing this with five, six people, um, only in Shay. We want to share our experience. We want to share our knowledge with others. And what we do in Shea, somebody else can do uh, with cocoa or with something else. What we do in Africa might also be possible in Asia. So, uh, and, 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 and to dream big, our fantasy is that what we have developed in return on extraction is the new standard for sustainable international trading and it's healing it's healing people it's healing the planning and it's healing our economy and, and our 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 minds yeah i i love the way you describe sustainability it's really focusing on the core of it and not just these you know surface level eco-friendly words that are now part of a lot of the people's um, corporate social responsibility reporting requirements, you know, it's like this, these things that are so nebulous for people. But what you described to us today is truly what sustainability is. How do you create something that not only empowers, but gives um, people the ability to take over an ownership and then also can be a vehicle for change that other people can be inspired from and learn from and grow from what you've learned? Because I think what you described to us today was a beautiful journey of implementation. And over the course of implementation, there's always going to be different decisions and different paths that you could take. But over time, um, being able to see the outcomes like the center being built, like the women being empowered, like the, um, the ability to go from a couple ounces to kilo, <laughs> you know, those outcomes and then the financial outcomes um, those things you can learn from and lessons you learn along the way are really powerful. And so I'm just grateful for you for sharing those with us today. And I wanted to ask you one last question. Um, if you could, so with the, the not only Netherlands markets that you're looking for um, some folks in that space, but also knowing that our audience does include United States as well. If you could tell folks where they can find you to support you, and how they can support the foundation if um, if they're able to directly do that or even buy the products. Where can people interact with you online and just give a little commercial for yourself in that way. Folks know how to catch up with you after the episode. I think the best way is to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a foundation. People can give donations to the foundation direct on our bank accounts. Uh, People can buy our shea butter already. So we have started an Indiegogo pre-sales campaign. So you can already order your jar of shea butter 
which will be delivered next year. And that is how you help us with pre-funding of our production. And we are looking for uh, angel investors who help us with pre-funding our next production. Um, and brands are welcome, but we are also uh, uh, working with loads. So there are plenty of opportunities to support us and to help us. And there's a meet and, and there is a return. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead. Did you have another? Oh, the, 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 uh, of course. Tipalia Women's Association has a website, the foundation, not yet. I was just pulling that up. <laughs> Deep, is it deepalia.com? Yes. Okay. Yes. I was just going to uh, pull that up. So I think that that's great. Um, and from the website, is that where folks, consumers are able to make that purchase of the pre-order? No, that that's, is? That, that is a campaign on Indiegogo. Oh, in Indiegogo. Okay. There's an Indiegogo campaign. Uh, uh, and, and it's called. Uh, I'm going to uh, very quickly just share the website so folks know, just to make sure that they uh, can see what it looks like here. Let me pull it up. Sorry, it's not sharing. Let's see. Where are you? There it is. Here we go. So here's the website. Right. This is the, I think, the bottom of the screen. <laughs> I've been looking at it earlier. <laughs> but this is, gives people a little bit of an example of what this looks like. I thought this was such powerful imagery on your website to instantly take someone who's never been to an African village right into the heart of what it looks like to make shea butter. And this is exactly what you were talking about in terms of the labor-intensive um, process. This is still in the village. So this is yeah. how the women made shea butter. That's the leader, Safura. Uh, th this is how the women made shea butter before they had the center. And now... That's uh, so cool. Yeah, here you can see how it is in the center. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's facilities neat. that they didn't have. Yeah, that's great. And here's the tree and the product, which I think is awesome. Yeah, the jars are going to be a little bit different, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, yeah, that's the product. And you can you can read our story here, our history. You can even see on Google Maps where the center is, uh, uh, and there is a donation button uh, there as well. And, um, for uh, staying in touch, connect with Deepalia Women's Association on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Connect with me, and and then you can also. See, we are currently running a campaign. We are making small movies and, 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 and things. So you can follow us there. And, and also there you can find uh, the link to the Indiegogo uh, campaign. And you can become part of our community. We hope to engage people in the US and in Europe uh, to become part of our community, uh, following us, uh, a regular client of our Shea Butter, uh, seeing the progress, and um, this is how you can contribute. And if there's somebody seriously interested in becoming our agent in the U.S., uh, then that will be interesting as well. If somebody wants to be an importer in the United States, that is also interesting for us. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that as well. So folks know exactly how to reach you and how to connect and support you. I love that. And so this has been another wonderful episode. Thank you so much um, for bringing us this story about not only your journey, but also taking us into the community. And I, I do absolutely want to get that Google map from you to see what we've been, where we've been talking about. So I will put it in the show notes to make sure that folks not only have access to the information on how to contact you, how to support our community of women who are making shea butter for us and how to get it as part of the consumer market. So we'll add all those things to the show notes so folks can get um, get the details. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us for another wonderful episode. This has been Alain Boltz, and I've been practicing saying his name for the longest time. <laughs> Hopefully I did it justice, but it's been great to interview you and hear more about your story. And I hope that you have... Um, had a wonderful time with us and you'll remain part of the collective that we're joining of social entrepreneurs. Yes, yes. Right, it was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much.
thank you for joining us for another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. It's been awesome to interview today's guests, and I hope that you leave inspired to take action. If you're looking for any of the information we spoke about, it's probably down in the show notes. Make sure that you're checking them out and you're clicking on any of the links that seem exciting to you. If you are looking for a coach or a consultant to help you with your social impact or your sustainability, reach out to me via my my website, hop on my email list, or jump into one of my programs. All of the links are below. So excited to have you as part of the collective. Make sure that you come back and join us for another episode next week.